Hi everyone. Thanks for tuning into this CCT 2022 talk on influences in completely bounded forms and classical simulation of quantum algorithms. I'm Makran and this is joint work with Nikhil Pansal and Ronald De Wolf. So the main question that motivates this talk is towards understanding for what kind of problems can quantum computers offer us a huge advantage over classical computers? What sort of structure must these problems have in order for a quantum algorithm to be able to utilize it? And to formalize this question and make it a bit more concrete, we are going to study this in the model of query complexity. In this talk, we are going to focus on decision problems. So f is a function of n bits, which outputs either accepts, reject, or don't care. So you might have a promise problem or a partial function as well. And in the model of query complexity, the algorithm interacts with the input as a black box. So the algorithm can ask for a particular bit of the input, and it gets that particular bit back if the algorithm is classical. And the objective in this setting is to compute this function f and minimize the number of queries while doing so. So the trivially the query complexity of any function f in this setting is at most n since you can read the entire input and then compute the function f. And as most of you are probably familiar with, this model is exactly the same as a uh, decision tree. So you ask for a bit x1, depending on its uh, answer, you ask for another bit and so on. And these are exactly the same model. So quantum algorithm in this model also interacts with the input as a black box, but it can ask for input bits in a superposition. And the answer also comes back in a superposition. This is a very natural model to study quantum algorithms because almost all quantum algorithms that we know of are query algorithms. And the number of queries serves as a very good proxy for runtime of these algorithms. So just to make this a little bit more concrete, let me give you some simple examples. So consider the following task. You are given a bit strings of zeros and one, and your goal is to check if there is a one or not in the string. So you want to compute the OR of these bits. So classically, this requires n queries. You have to essentially read all the input bits. But uh, there is a quantum algorithm by Grover Search that can solve the same problem with uh, square root n queries, so polynomially faster. So consider a different task where the advantage is even better. Suppose you are given a truth table of a function, a Boolean function, and you want to check whether this function is close to being a periodic function or far from being a periodic function. And periodic function just means it repeats after a certain period. So classically, this requires polynomially in n queries. But uh, Simon's algorithm allows us to solve the same problem with only log n quantum queries. So this gives an exponential advantage in this case. And these two examples, they demonstrate uh, two different categories of problems. The example on the left is an example of a total function. We, we care about all possible inputs here. And here the separation is polynomial. The example on the right uh, is a promise problem or partial function. Because uh, in, for in between examples, when the function is neither close or far from periodic function, we don't care what the algorithm outputs. In this case, the separa separation is exponential. And in fact, this kind of phenomena is much more general in query complexity. So for any total function, quantum algorithms can only have a polynomial advantage. And there's a very long line of work uh, that tries that has tried to pinpoint the best polynomial dependence, both in terms of upper and lower bounds. And for partial functions, as we just saw, there can be exponential advantage. But in fact, the advantage can even be arbitrary. And again, there's a very long line of work trying to pinpoint the best dependence here. But the important thing to remember is uh, for a quantum algorithm to have a super polynomial uh, speed up or advantage over a classical algorithm, we, we need to work with partial functions because for total functions, there is no hope. So the next question one can ask, what sort of partial functions uh, can have super polynomial speed ups? If we look at all uh, examples that we know of where there is a super polynomial speed ups, for instance, checking whether a function is close to being periodic or not. Then in most of these examples, there is usually a very small set of structured solutions that we care about. For instance, the set of periodic functions, which is much, much smaller than uh, 
a set of functions which are far from being periodic. And the quantum algorithm is very good at finding uh, the, uh, this small structured set. So this uh, motivates this conjecture, which is a folklore conjecture from the 90s. And I will call it the almost everywhere simulation conjecture. It says that if you have a d-query quantum algorithm, you can simulate it classically. You can approximate its acceptance probability up to some small additive error. It's only a polynomial overhead on one minus delta fraction of the inputs. So if you ignore this small set of uh, structured solutions, which you should think of as the delta fraction of the entire space, then you can simulate this uh, quantum algorithm classically with only a polynomial overhead. So this is a, a very well known open problem in the field of uh, quantum query complexity. And uh, essentially what I mean by structured problems uh, is problems that look like this essentially, at least in this talk. But let me mention that again, in this context also, there is a distinction between search and decision problems, which is usually not the case in the, for classical algorithms. Uh, in a very cool paper by Yamakawa and Chandri, they showed that exponential speedups are still possible even for unstructured search or sampling problems. And since this is a little bit tangential, I'm not going to go into more detail here. And our focus will be on proving this uh, almost every simulation conjecture, which is about decision uh, problems. So this conjecture first appeared in the paper of Anderson and Banis, who proposed the approach towards proving it via Fourier analysis on the Boolean function. And for this, they proposed another conjecture that is now called the Anderson and Banis conjecture, which is about uh, Fourier analysis on the hypercube. So for introduce this conjecture, let me introduce some basic notation. So suppose uh, we know that any function on the hypercube, you can write it always as a multilinear polynomial in n bits. And the coefficients of these polynomials are the Fourier coefficients. They're indexed by subsets of n. And two quantities that will be use, important to remember for this talk. The first is the variance of this uh, polynomial on the hypercube, which is just given by sums of squares of all non-empty Fourier coefficients. And the influence of the ith bit of the, the, this polynomial which uh, is the sums of squares of all coefficients where i is included in the set. And you can also view it as the expected value of the squared ith derivative of the polynomial. So how is this related to the, the conjecture about simulating uh, almost every quantum algorithms almost everywhere? And the connection comes from this fact that if you have a d query quantum algorithm, you can represent its acceptance probability as a degree 2D multilinear polynomial. So acceptance probability of quantum algorithms can always be written as low degree multilinear polynomials. And for low degree multilinear polynomials, there's a very nice connection between the influences and the variance in the sense that the sum of all influences, which is the total influence, is essentially the same as variance up to these uh, factors of D, which we are thinking of it as very small in this case. So the total influence is essentially the same as variance and this motivated Anderson and Bynes to propose this very natural conjecture. It says that if you have a degree D multilinear polynomial that is bounded, so for our purposes, this polynomial represents the probability, so it takes values between zero and one. So if you have a bounded polynomial on the hypercube that is low degree, then it always has a variable whose influence is at least polynomial in the variance and one over D. And if you, if, so, if this is always true, then there is a very natural classical algorithm that uh, approximates the acceptance probability of a quantum algorithm. The algorithm just queries the most influential variable. This reduces the variance by at least the, the influence of this, this variable. And if you do this polynomially in variance in d many times, then your variance of your function will reduce, uh, will become very, very small. And at that point, you can approximate this function by its expected value. So this gives us a very natural algorithm to approximate the acceptance uh, probability of a quantum algorithm. So this is called the Ernest and Bynes conjecture in the literature. And uh, I mean, uh, what is known about this conjecture? We don't know a lot, but we do know some things. For instance, we know that in any bounded polynomial, there is always a variable whose influence is at least the exponential factor in D. And this gives us a way of simulating d-query quantum algorithms with two to the d classical queries, almost everywhere. 
So note that this is not possible if you care about all inputs because there are, you can have even super exponential advantage there. But uh, if you care about almost every simulations, then this at least shows that you can have at most exponential separation. We also know that the conjecture is true in some specific settings. For instance, if your polynomial is uh, Boolean, it only takes zero or one values instead of values between zero and one. And this is somewhat non-trivial to prove, but not that difficult. And the conjecture is also true for bounded polynomials. If all coefficients have the same magnitudes and the polynomial has a special structure that is homogeneous and block multilinear. So what these polynomials are, I will come to it later in the talk because that's what we're going to focus on. But for now, uh, this will suffice. And in the same way, you can remove this uh, uh, constraint. But uh, for any bound general bounded polynomial, if all coefficients have the same magnitude, then we do know of a sub-exponentially large uh, influential variable. And these two uh, uh, known results, they look very uh, restrictive, but they are quite difficult to prove. They rely on some very powerful inequalities in, in functional analysis called the bone and blue steel inequalities. And lastly, we do know that, uh, uh, I mean, to prove the general version of this conjecture, it suffices to study polynomials with uh, certain special one block decoupled structure. So in this talk, we're going to focus on the case of block multilinear polynomials. So what are these polynomials? So here, the, the set of variables is partitioned into D blocks, and each block has N variables. And each monomial of the polynomial, it contains at most one variable from each of the blocks. For instance, if your polynomial is homogeneous, it looks like you choose one index from each block, and that is the particular monomial you get. And the coefficients of this polynomial are indexed by the, the indices, the tuple of indices you choose for each of the blocks. And we care about such polynomials that are bounded. And the reason we care about them and the connection to quantum algorithms is that sort of such polynomials capture amplitudes of quantum algorithms that are sort of query disjoint blocks. In the first query, the algorithm query is, makes a superposition query to a different part of the input. In the second query, it makes a superposition query to a different part of the input, and so on. Uh, and then it makes a measurement at the end. So such uh, uh, algorithms can be represented by these block multilinear polynomials. And these block multi, uh, these such algorithms look quite uh, special. But even uh, th these algorithms can exhibit super exponential speed ups. For instance, problems like k fold correlation and its variance, they exhibit maximal possible separation you can have between quantum and classical algorithms, uh, just in terms of uh, these special kinds of algorithms. And even for this special case of block multilinear polynomials, the, uh, we don't know much about the Anderson Weiss conjecture. The only case we know of is when all coefficients have the same magnitude in which case the conjecture is true. So, so for us, since we care about uh, block multilinear polynomials that come from quantum algorithms, we can restrict this class even further. And this relies on a very nice new characterization of Arunachan, Briet, and Palazuelos. We showed that block multilinear polynomials that come from quantum algorithms, they're not just bounded on the hypercube, uh, but they are also completely bounded. And what this means, I will tell you about in a second. But uh, before doing so, let me mention that uh, they also show a characterization in the sense that such polynomials completely characterize quantum algorithms in a certain sense uh, that I'm not going to describe here. So we're going to need the first part of this statement, which, which says that any uh, quantum algorithms gives a, a block multilinear polynomial that is completely bounded. So what does completely bounded mean? So completely bounded just means that the completely bounded norm of this polynomial is small. And this norm is defined as follows. So instead of plugging in scalar plus minus one values, we're plugging unitaries with operator norm at most one. And these unitaries can have arbitrary dimensions. Uh, and this gives us a matrix polynomial, a non-commutative polynomial. And note that since the, each monomial contains at most one variable from each of the blocks and the blocks are ordered, uh, this uh, defines a, I mean, this is a well-defined non-commutative polynomial. So 
And the completely bounded norm of this polynomial is the supremum or the maximum operator norm you can have uh, when you plug in any uh, any uh, use uh, instead of the instead of plus minus one values you plug in uh, matrices with operator norm at most one. So this is the completely bounded norm of a polynomial. And note that if your polynomial is completely bounded, meaning that its supremum is bounded over all uh, matrices as well then it's also bound under the hypercube because instead of plugging in matrices you can plug in plus minus one values which are just one dimensional matrices which satisfy this condition so completely bounded polynomials are also bounded under the hypercube but this is a much stronger uh, condition and our main result is that we show that if your polynomial is completely bounded and low degree then the rents and the bunnies conjecture is true for such polynomials there's always a variable whose influence is at least polynomial in the variance and in the one over degree. And this gives us a way to uh, simulate all uh, quantum algorithms that query disjoint blocks almost everywhere with only a polynomial overhead. So such algorithms uh, cannot give us a super polynomial advantage uh, for unstructured problems. So, what goes on into proving this result. And to describe this, I'm going to focus on the case of homogeneous uh, polynomials, which sort of uh, each monomial is of degree d. And so since you, are, you have uh, d different sets of variables, you just choose uh, one variable from each of the blocks. So this is how such a polynomial looks like. And uh, again, uh, the variance of such a polynomial is the sums of squares of all coefficients which are indexed by tuples in n to the d now. And I will use this notation, the influence of the ith variable in the first block, which is influence of 1 comma i, is just given by sums of squares of all coefficient, where the first index is set to i. And what we show is this following key lemma, which says that completely bounded norm of any polynomial is lower bounded by 1 over square root uh, degree times sum of square root of influences of the first block for any homogeneous polynomial. So this uh, looks a little bit strange, but how this relates to the first theorem, I'm going to tell you uh, in a second. But uh, the key point to, but this relies on connections to the free probability theory, and this is a very nice area to know about that allows us to prove this theorem. So how does this imply the main theorem? So, I mean, we know that uh, we can bound each square root of influence by the influence divided by the square root of the maximum influence. And uh, the sum of all influences in the first block, just by the definitions above, is exactly the variance. So this essentially says that the completely bounded norm is lower bounded by the variance times some square root d times the square root of the maximum influence. And if your completely bounded norm is bounded by one, then just rearranging uh, gives us that the maximum influence is at least uh, polynomial in the variance and the degree. And the same ideas you can uh, use for general F as well, that are not homogeneous with some loss. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on this root influence inequality now and tell you what goes on into proving this. So this lemma is essentially saying that uh, the completely bounded norm is large. So it's, we need to find a witness which certifies that the completely bounded norm of a polynomial is at least this quantity. So first of all, let's just start to plugging scalar values, plus minus one values. So we'll choose uh, for each monomial, we'll just choose plus minus one values for each of the variables. So, so we're going to put the, choose x true to xt completely uniformly at random. And we're going to choose x1 uh, depending on the sign of the particular uh, monomial in front of it. Okay. So this basically tells you, just by taking expectation, that the completely bounded norm is lower bounded by sum over all values, all indices of the first block, the expected value of this, absolute value of this inner polynomial. And here, the absolute value comes in exactly because we chose an x1 to be the sign of this particular monomial. So we want to show that this quantity is large. So we want to say that this expected value which of each term, which is again a degree d minus one polynomial is large. 
So we need some kind of anti-concentration result which says that the, the expected absolute value or the first moment of a polynomial is large. And one uh, general principle about proving anti-concentration result is to use concentration inequalities. And one of the very well-known concentration inequalities about polynomials is hypercontractivity. It says that the, the fourth moment of a polynomial is bounded by some exponential factors in D times the second moment, the square root of the second moment. And uh, combined with the, the fourth moment method, this gives us a lower bound on the uh, on the first moment or the expected absolute value of this polynomial, which says that the, ex the first moment is lower bounded by some exponentially small factors in D times the standard deviation of this polynomial. And as we just uh, saw from before, that the variance of each each inner term is exactly the sums of squares of all coefficients, and the first thing is fixed to i. So you get that uh, a completely bounded norm is lower bounded by this quantity, and uh, the inner quantity is exactly the influence of the ith pit of the first block. So we get this inequality. So this uh, inequality looks essentially the, the same as the lemma, except with the exponentially large uh, factor in D. And note that in this argument, I mean, this also gives a lower bound on the uh, infinity norm, since we are just plugging in plus minus one values. And uh, in this case, the loss of exponential in D factor is necessary. There are some examples which show it. So in order to prove this lemma, we're going to use the full power we have at our disposal because in, complete, in the definition of completely bounded norm, we can plug in arbitrary unitaries of any dimensions. So we're just going to plug in uh, unitaries instead and of very large dimensions. And uh, again, uh, we're going to plug in random unitaries for everything except the first block. And again, in a very similar fashion, which I'm not going to go into detail here, uh, the task boils down to understanding the uh, how's the operator norm of low degree polynomials in random hard unitary is concentrated. So if these uh, if you're plugging scalar values, you have absolute value there, but now you have operator norm if you're plugging matrices here. And the key idea by this everything works is that the operator norm of uh, low degree non commutative polynomials in random unitaries is much much better concentrated. And what we need is already known in the literature. So let me just uh, describe uh, what is known. So suppose we have a non-commutative homogeneous degree D polynomial. It doesn't even need to be block multilinear. And one common way of computing the operator norm is by considering the trace of some higher power of the matrix. So, and here trace is the normalized trace, which is the trace divided by the dimension of the matrix. If you take in uh, some higher power, the largest singular value will dominate and all the other terms will be insignificant. So if you take the limit, then this will be exactly with operator norm. So to compute the operator norm uh, or the concentration properties, you, you want to compute this non-commutative moment. Uh, for when you plug in random unitary matrices. It becomes very difficult to compute because uh, random unitary matrices have some dependencies and this is where free probability comes in. So free probability basically tells you that the uh, behavior of these large random matrices as their dimension tends to infinity converges to, uh, you can study the, the, this behavior by uh, studying some deterministic infinite dimensional objects. And free probability sort of gives you a calculus to do uh, compute with these things. So for instance, a very nice work by Collins and Mail shows that the operator norm of polynomials in random unitary matrices converges with probability one to the operator norm of the same polynomial evaluated on these infinite dimensional linear operators that are called free higher unitaries. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you what they are here, but they're sort of limiting objects uh, which these uh, unitary matrices converge to in some sense. And uh, I mean, these infinite dimensional objects are deterministic. I mean, there's no randomness there. They have been studied for a long time, so bounds on their operator norm have been known since the 70s. Uh, so Hager proved this in the 70s, and we rely on an uh, improved uh, dependence uh, proven by Kemp and Speicher, who showed that uh, the operator norm of such polynomials is bounded by 
the sums of squares of all coefficients times only a square root d factor instead of exponential factor. And if you combine these two results, uh, we sort of get our inequality with only a polynomial loss there. And sort of the key the idea behind why this works again is because the operator norm of low degree polynomials is much, much better concentrated. And uh, essentially, that's pretty much the end of the talk. Let me conclude with some open problems. So again, uh, we proved uh, almost every simulation conjecture for a special type of quantum algorithms. And one very nice uh, direction to understand is whether we can use this characterization of our Arnachan Braves and Palazuelos, which I didn't talk about much here, to make progress on general quantum algorithms as well. But this kind of connection still relies by influences of polynomials. And maybe there is a whole different way of uh, designing classical algorithms without talking about influences, which might be easier to make progress on. For instance, in a very nice paper of Aronson, Ingram, and Kashmir, they managed to prove almost everywhere simulation result, and queries are made to a sparse oracle, uh, sorry, where the inputs are sort of always sparse, which is not the setting we are interested in, but maybe the, there is something to be done here. Lastly, there is a minus conjecture about bounded polynomials. This is a very nice mathematical statement on its own. And uh, we don't know much about this conjecture. It would be very uh, interesting to prove or disprove this even in very special cases. So thank you very much.